All right, so today I want to talk about the role of neurorehabilitation with Parkinson's disease. And specifically, we're going to talk about one diagnostic procedure that we can look at to see if the treatment is working. My name is Dr. Nathan Kaiser. I'm here in Chelsea, Michigan. We help people with neurological conditions get better. Today we're going to talk about Parkinson's disease in a case that we looked at just the other day. Technically, this person had not been previously diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, however, meets UPDRS criteria. So that's hard news to break to someone. But what we were looking at was in the process of helping them to initiate a neurorehabilitation program to help with balance, to be able to help with mobility, we honed in on a specific diagnostic marker that's really helpful in his caretakers being able to understand the effect of the treatment over time on the neurology of, of the physiology involved. So let's start with that and talk a little bit about what was going on. When you think about Parkinson's disease, they think about tremor is actually not the first thing that we tend to see. So if we look at that a little bit more clinically, the things we notice earlier on in the game are slowing of movements, and we call this bradykinesia. And this is just a slowing of movements. And we tend to see it in a few different places first. So number one, we'll see it in our face. It will become hypomemic, where if you stop blinking as much, then it can turn into not having normal facial expressions. So people will start to have what looks like a blank facial expression. We can see it in the way they move their hands. So one of the tests that we look at is a finger tapping test, where you have people tap their fingers and you do that as big and as fast as they can. And the things that we'll notice is that they start to slow down and they start to have errors in that movement. And you can see the same things when people tap their feet. We can see it in the way they walk. So gait becomes really important. We can see that people slow their gait. They take smaller steps. They, on the way to shuffling, we can see that they start to lose the swing of their arms. And in this case, one of the things that we notice that isn't always true, but is more true when we affect pathways that affect our ability to sense gravity or our ability to use the vestibular system is we start to see what's called a PISA sign. And a PISA sign is when we're looking at somebody seated, rather than sitting like that, they will actually deviate. And the same thing can happen in a pusher syndrome after someone has a stroke, but the main difference is that if you just give them cues and sit them up, then they can be there. But their natural position will be to sit with their trunk lean to the side. This is where we start to see these bradykinesias. And that bradykinesia, the next thing that happens is it starts to turn into hesitations. And then we see these walking. Somebody might be walking and then they encounter an obstacle and they kind of like have a little double pump. Or we see it with finger tapping where they might have these little breakdowns in the movement of their fingers. So let's go to the next part. And then the next kind of progression is when we look at freezing. So we go from hesitating to full on stopping. This can happen again with gait, with the way we move our hands, the way we move our feet, the way our face is kind of frozen in a hypomemic position. And all of these things eventually, plus some medication, end up with a tremor. The, the process of Parkinson's actually starts 30 years before the onset of a tremor. Very important to try to get in front of these things early. The one part of this we left out is we see these same features when we look at eye movements. And these are very easy to see and very important because the area of the brain that is affected most significantly when we look at Parkinson's disease are the dopaminergic producing neurons in the substantia nigra in the midbrain. The midbrain is also where we house the nuclei that help us to generate eye movements, specifically fast eye movements that we call saccades. These are eye movements that we use to kind of adjust our eyes to look at a new target. One of the things that we will see early on, let's we have someone look at just two different targets and you can put them on a straight line you can put them on diagonal lines you can put them up and down they all are going to stimulate different areas within the brain stem based on those nuclei but what we'll see if we have someone look back and forth boom, 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 like that that they will tend to do these same features where they will get slower they will have hesitations or they will have freezing so if we think about that in the relationship of eye movements when we have them jump back and forth doing these saccades, we will see that they will either be slower or hesitating or freezing, which means that the eyes kind of, rather than bouncing back fluidly, will kind of get stuck or stutter at different points. And we pay attention because the direction of the movement tells us which side of that midbrain is more affected than the other and how that then affects the brain that it talks to. So for example, let's say we're looking at this B, that B would then be on the left side relative to the A, which would be on the right side. So if I'm hesitating or getting stuck on the B as I'm jumping my eyes over to the A, then I'm having a hesitation as I move toward this A. That means that we're having a greater amount of dysfunction that's happening on the left side. So this is very important with how we then think about our strategies for rehabilitation because we want to do things that are going to affect 
that portion of the mid midbrain to have a positive effect. In the case that we're talking about, we use this because the, the person also has a neuropathy, a peripheral neuropathy in the legs that's pretty severe, but it mostly affects the side that we want to stimulate on the right to talk to that part of the brain. So we could use that as a mechanism by increasing sensory afferents on this side to be able to stimulate that portion of the midbrain. But remember, we're dealing with tissue that's already kind of sick. It's not very strong. That's why we have these symptoms to start with. So if we have tissues that aren't as strong or they're, they're not as healthy, then it's kind of like if you have the flu, that's not the best time to do a personal record on the bench press, right? You have to work back up to it. Kind of a similar idea here is you don't want to just start by blasting those sensory afferents because the ability of that target tissue to tolerate it isn't going to be as high. And the stakes are high on that because if we overactivate these neurons, we run the risk of harming them more. So we need to be able to kind of hit the Goldilocks sweet spot where we are giving enough stimulus so we have a minimum effective dose to cause plasticity, right? But we want to balance that against going too much and actually having a negative effect on that brain tissue. In this case, what we decided to do then was use those saccades, those back and forth, hey, look at these two thumbs, back and forth as quickly as you can, as a before and after measurement each time this person does anything therapeutically so that we can tell very quickly the dosage that we need to operate on so that we don't overwhelm those cells. So uh, there's a caretaker that's going to help this team execute these exercises every day. The thing that we're going to do is then use those back and forth saccades to measure if the person is getting better or if they are fatiguing or getting worse. That's our that's the tool that we're going to use in this case to monitor progress and to make sure that each rep, each time they do their neuro rehabilitation protocol, we're making sure that we're not overwhelming those cells, keeping the dosage correct, aiming for that minimal effective dose, right? What is the least amount we can do to be effective at that range? It allows us to be able to have the highest margin of safety to not affect those cells negatively. Is this just an application that we use in Parkinson's based syndromes? No. This is how we want to think about neuro rehabilitation in general. So we want to have markers that point to the areas of the brain that we're trying to affect to know if we are hitting the dose correctly, if we're having a positive output, or if we are overwhelming it, having a negative output. And that allows us to stay in the range so that over time we can see, just like the stock market, we want to see a trend line that goes up and to the right as far as function goes. Okay, so this is time and this is function or capacity. We want it to head in this direction. Now there may be some yo-yoing going up the mountain, but we want to see it follow that trend. And one of the ways that we can do that is by making sure the dosage of exercise is effective. We don't do too little, but we also don't do too much. So I hope that's useful. If you have questions, send us an email and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.